Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the Zoning Board of uh, Appeals, a meeting of Tuesday, March 26, 2013. It is now 7.05 p.m. Um, I uh, will call the meeting to order and uh, ask like, the first item is to uh, uh, approve the uh, minutes of the February 26, 2013 meeting. The so moved. Second. Any modifications, changes? No. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? I zip. Six zip. Sorry about that. Can't count. Uh, okay. The. Uh, the first uh, item we have on the uh, uh, no old business. Let's see, uh, so our new business is uh, first item is uh, uh, to hear uh, the request of uh, Jennifer and Kevin Flock of 243 Spurwink Ave, Map U27, Lot 19, for conditional use of permit for a home business. Um, I uh, we have uh, this item and an, uh, a variance request from. Uh, 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 the uh, Nassau Sir uh, family, and uh, I'd like to ask if we could reverse the order and uh, move the request for uh, Mohammed Nassau Sir first and the uh, the flock second. Uh, I know we have some members in the audience who are here for one versus the other, so uh, we're we're pretty flexible up here, but. Uh, if we could reverse the order, it, it would serve our purpose because I'm going to have to recuse myself from the, the, uh, the flocks uh, uh, application. Okay, I, I'll take that as yeah, it's okay, go ahead. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll switch up and uh, the first uh, item is to hear the request of Mohammed Nasser Sir of 41. Ocean House Road, map U28, lot 10-4, for approval to expand the second floor of a house into a non-conforming area. Uh, Mr. Schur will be represented by his contractor, Jeffrey Averill. Um, I think before we get started, uh, the board would just like to hear from the code enforcement officer on any background uh, for this particular application. Sure. There, prior to me being here, there was a permit issued uh, for Mr. Shear to e expand his house vertically. That application, it's, it's roughly two-thirds of the house is expanding vertically, and the reason why he stopped it there was because of the setback line. Uh, subsequent to that, a surveyor measured uh, the, the, the nearest two abutting properties. There's, in, in the zoning ordinance, it says if you take the average <coughs> of the two nearest principal <coughs> structures, you can reduce the front setback. That setback brings it from 30 to uh, 21.75, which is one foot shy of allowing the whole house to, to add a second story. So the code enforcement office has the authority to issue a permit for 96% of this house to vertically expand. To get that additional foot, it requires a board approval to just be able to add a full second floor to the structure. Okay, sir, we're going to have you come up and make a presentation in a minute. So. We just want to hear from the code enforcement officer. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's the history of it. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I guess, uh, Mr. Avril, you're representing Mr. Uh, sure, so if you'd like to come up and, and uh, make your presentation, and uh, if we could keep it to five minutes or less, that would be great. Okay, again, we need, need. Do all have the actual documentation, right? 
We, we can hear you, but uh, because it's videotaped, if you're not in front of the microphone, people at home won't be able to. If you look at your paperwork that we provided, we're looking for a two by four section, a triangle section, to can make this house a conforming home. Right now, the way the setback says it slices through the back, northeast corner, the shear is off a small section. If we follow setback, we can only, we, this, it'll actually be a four-sided structure going around that corner. What we're looking to do is complete the corner. We're, we want to change that zoning, that setback number from 21.75 to a 19.8. We want to complete that corner, make it a, make it a conforming home. If you look at your uh, drawings that we provided in the paperwork, you can actually see that small section, the way the setback is, it just slices through that back corner of the house. Can you all see that in the drawing? Yep. Any questions? Is that shaded area existing first floor structure? That shaded area is existing first floor. So you'd just be continuing that line up? Straight up. And actually, if you look at the little overhang, that's actually a, just a roof or a garage. That section isn't going up. It's just the actual rectangle, the 50 by 26, that's going straight up. OK, yeah. so the smaller rectangle on the back is not going up? Correct. It's just a roof line. It's just, yeah, it's just a roof line. So it's yeah, that if you, teeny tiny little triangle. That's it's that teeny the... tiny little triangle we're trying to conform and, and actually square up. It's it's it looks teeny tiny right now, but it's actually a two by four. Yep. But uh, if you're actually it's trying to build a house, triangle. There's two triangles, and it's the front one. It's the it's the one on the actual home right on the house. There's actually a, a small roof overhang over the garage area, right. It's the teeny tiny one that you're looking at. What we want to do is square that up. I imagine that will greatly simplify the construction. Oh boy, yeah, yeah, it would, yeah, of, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would simplify the construction and actually would make it, you know, I mean, if you had, you, you had a home that looked like this and, and had those four, you know, those, those bends, it, it just makes sense to square it off. Do you have a photograph of the building, of the house? What's that? I want to see his. Do you have a photograph of the house? We have, no, we don't have a photo. We have a current photograph of the house online, but we don't have, no. No, I don't have a photograph of the house. We do have a plan of what, of what the house is going to look like. We submitted that. With the, we have a, a permit that's been issued to do, like he said, two thirds of it. We have that plan. We have an updated plan that'll show the whole house before we amend the the um, permit. What we're trying to do here, folks, is square this up so that it makes sense. And and, and just so I'm make sure I'm reading the uh, the diagram right. The, the first floor is uh, that corner is already at the at the 19.8? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's existing. Okay. Yeah, the so, first floor is there. Okay. And so, again, this is literally a vertical. That's all it is. Vertical rise. That's all, That's all it is. is. It's, 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 yeah, it's strictly just a vertical rise. Yep. I know through the just on the application there's no somewhat redundant but there's no uh, change in the size of the lot no change in the size of the footprint no the footprint remains the same yeah we're going straight up we're turning a 50 by 26 raised ranch into a colonial we were approved for a 40 by 26 and then we 
we looked at the rules and we were allowed to go the average setback. The reason we're applying for that is because we would, we would end up with that odd, non-conforming look. It would turn the corner and it would just make for a, a real unusual home. And I don't think, you know, in, in this town, I, uh, aesthetics, aesthetics, yeah. Isn't that what we want? We want a, a conforming house, squared edges, squared corners. I don't think this is unreasonable. I think it's just, it, it's a two by four area really small square footage. What we're trying to do is square this off. Uh, we, how about as far as the, uh, your abutters, have they uh, raised any objections to, to this? No, none at all, no, no. We, we, um, we, we got the approval for the uh, first permit to do the original addition. Yeah. We, we sent out notices and um, yeah. Yeah, everybody was okay and comfortable with what we were doing, doing that second story. Yeah, okay. And, and has the construction started or are we just we're waiting for pending this variance? We've, we've started some construction with demo and, and getting, getting going with the original, yeah. with the original permit, but we, um, before we run to that outer edge of that building, we want to make sure that we're amended and approved, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else uh, as far as the presentation goes you'd like to add? Uh, actually, there's no presentation. Uh, ben has articulated very well our issue. Uh, my reason was aesthetic reason. The corner inside is difficult, uh, geometry-wise and also cost-wise. Alternative is that I can build the same size house in L shape in my lot. I have big enough lot, but the foundation for that costs a lot of money. So I am going up vertically for budget reason as well. Okay, that's obviously creating a bit of a financial difficulty if you were yes. to do the L shape. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, comments from the from the public at all? The application. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll we'll close the uh, the uh, the presentation portion of the of the uh, meeting. Ben, did, did, uh, did you have um, anything else as far as um, the application itself you want to share with us? Well, I, I would just point out findings of fact number three. Uh, most, most of those factors are not germane to this application because it's not a footprint expansion. The size of the lot, slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, location of other structures on the property, location of septic system, there is no septic system on the property. Uh, I, m m an amount of vegetation to be removed with, with no footprint expansion, th those factors would not be affected, in my opinion. My only other comment on the uh, proposed findings of fact is number four. The proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. I think technically it will, but we're voting to permit it, right? Well, we haven't voted yet. Well, if, if we vote, <laughs> if we were to vote to permit it, we would be uh, technically it is increasing. The, uh, I guess the question is a vertical <clears throat> increase inside of a setback that will increase the nonconformity, or the, the position is it doesn't. The position is it doesn't, because the nonconformity we have is, is the setback to the property line, and they're not going to reduce that setback. Right. Okay. Is there? 
Presumably because the existing foundation or first floor is already under there, right? Right. Correct. So the fact that there's an increase in volume within the setback is not what is an increase in nonconformity? Correct. Right. Okay. Just wanted to clear that up. Uh, okay. Uh, any other uh, questions or thoughts from the uh, from the board? Okay. Are there any um, further additions or modifications to the uh, to the fi draft finding of facts on the application? We care to care to add. I don't know if it's redundant to, well, we don't have to add a, a denim to number four. We've got the question answered, haven't we, <laughs> as far as the increase in nonconformity. So, uh, okay. Uh, why don't we go ahead and have a motion uh, for the, uh, the application? And, but I move that we accept the application. I need to be I second the motion. Okay, so Chris has made the motion and Barry has seconded. Any comments? Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion as presented? Raise your hand. Any opposed? Okay, that's 6 0. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Am I reading these finding of facts into the record? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you are. I am. Okay. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, Here, praise guys. Here's my draft findings of fact. Does anyone have any revisions? All right. So here are the draft findings of fact. Um, uh, this is a request to reconstruct and expand a single family dwelling per section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance at map U28, lot 104 at 41 Ocean House Road. Mohammed Nasser Sir is the owner of record of the property at map U28, lot 104, 41 Ocean House Road. The authorized applicant is Jeffrey Averill. The Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system, uh, and other on soil, soil suitable for septic systems, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. The proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. The proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent. Are there any modifications, changes to these finding effects? Can we add an additional finding of fact that says that the um, proposed structure is a vertical expansion over an existing first floor that doesn't change the setback of that existing first floor? I'm writing, and then I'll regurgitate and you can I'm sure it'll be better than what I said. No. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, vertical expansion of an existing footprint that will not. Um. Would it be sufficient to simply say it's a vertical expansion within the existing footprint? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The proposed structure is a vertical expansion in an existing footprint. Within the existing footprint. With yep. In the existing footprint, period. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so we'll add a six finding of fact, which is the proposed structure is a vertical expansion within the existing footprint. Okay. And that motion carries overall six six zero. Do we want to vote on the thing? Just to okay. Only okay. Uh, let's let's uh, kind of a motion for the amended finding of fact. I move that we accept the amended 
list of findings of that. Second. I'll second. Okay. Uh, all in favor of the amended finding of fact? Any opposed? Okay. Six zero. All right. Now you can raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Th thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, the, uh, the next request, um, uh, I'm going to turn the uh, chairman's gavel over to uh, Chris Straw, who will chair this, oh, and uh, well, I we'll take it from here. <laughs> that's where we're at. That's where the team you've got over the town hall. We're at 243 square right there. I'm sorry. <coughs> All right, the next item on the agenda is to hear the, requ the request of Jennifer and Kevin Flock of 243 Spurwink Avenue, map U27, lot 19, for a conditional use permit for a home business. And before we hear from the uh, applicants, if the CEO could briefly summarize this issue for us. Sure. Uh, Jennifer and Kevin Flock came into our office <coughs> with a business proposal and we, we talked about that proposal and how it would work into the zoning ordinance and, and basically the the avenue for approval within the zoning ordinance is as a home business as, as a conditional use uh, conditional use home business uh, that requires approval from the zoning board and with that uh, can we hear from the applicants and um, if you can try to uh, first address, um, if you're familiar with it, the what uh, zone your property is in and how we have the basis to grant a um, conditional use permit. Um, the zone is RC, and we live on a road that is residents plus businesses already. We have several businesses on the road. Perpudic Golf Club, the medical building, um, an attorney. You can't hear me right now? Okay. Um, we live on a road that it has both residential and businesses. Our next door neighbor has a home therapy business. She sees customers all day long. Has a what? Home, home therapy, I believe. She's a counselor. Um, what we're proposing is to use our back room as a, an office for an email web-based store. Um, would be part-time. Um, it's in goes right along with all the uh, ordinances under the 1955. We went through all of them. Uh, we're not going to be. Um, I'm just going to pull it out so I can go through it real quick. Um, we're not going to be creating any traffic, hazardous traffic. I mean, Spurwink Avenue is a busy road already. I don't know who is and isn't familiar with it, but many, many cars go by. Um, and we will not be adding to that. Uh, we've also been in contact with Ben about how many trips per day even we're allowed to have, and it's 10 trips per day. And I don't even see us going that much, just because there might be some days we have zero, to be honest. Uh, the proposed use will not create anything unsanitary. Nothing's going to be outside. Um, so it will not adversely affect the value of the adjacent properties. Um, design external building. We're putting a door on our back, back room, and that's, that's it. So, and obviously, uh, it's your property, not mine. But are you sure it's an RC three and not an RP two? I believe it's RC. That's what we discussed at the. Uh, 
or we sh um, I might have an old map, but when, when I look at the map, it looks like it's RP2 to me. It, it, does, it does have an RP overlay o over the RC. Can you define that? I don't know what that I means. What that mean. uh, so there, there's uh, different districts in town. Um, our, uh, there's the RA, the RB, the RC. The RC tends to be the more heavily uh, developed areas of town. Uh, there's then also what's RP1, RP2, RP3. Uh, those are the resource protection uh, districts. Um, I think there, we, we've previously had a lively discussion as to whether the, the different sections in town are overlays or standalone districts. Um, in RP2, I guess that would then be the question is if it is in fact a overlay district or its own standalone district. Is it residential or is it commercial? Uh, I, mean, I know you're going to the fine points, but basically, is it a residential zoned house now, not for business? I believe it's an RP2 district, so which is technically a resource prote protection district, but it would be RC3. Um, it sounds like it's the code enforcement officer's comment underlaying the RP2, which would then be a kind of a high density residential. But it's residential. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any anything else to add? Well, I just go ahead. Would, would our neighbor who's the counselor, would she her business, would she be would it be the same status for uh, uh, if you could if you could talk at the microphone because although we can hear you to some extent, people at home uh, or on the video cannot. So Okay. Is our um, neighbor who's a counselor who has a business, is she in the same status as what we're applying for? My reading of the map is that you are just a property or so away from RC3. Um, I don't know which direction your neighbor's property lies. It doesn't, it, I mean, honestly, it doesn't really matter. It's what we're applying for. But our, I guess our point is, is that people in the neighborhood already have businesses, and all we're asking to do is have a home office. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, you're going into the, the wine business? Uh, yes. Liquor? I presume that in order to get your permit, you'll have to have proper zoning. State. Is, is, yeah, it's state yes. Like. Who I've been in discussion with already. I didn't even apply for this until I talked to the state. Okay. So in other words, you need this change in order to be able to sell wine. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I wouldn't apply for it if the state wasn't going to allow me because it, it'd be a moot point. Thank you. Yeah. What's, and, uh, go ahead. Sorry. And the only requirement we have is to block off the existing door. What? That, does, that doesn't matter to them. Oh. Okay. Inside, yeah. We have to make an outside door, that's all. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The state's requiring us to make an outside entrance to the room, that's all. Why don't you rent a store? I'm sorry? Why don't you rent a store? Uh, because this is the most economic way. We don't have a, an extra $1,000 a month to, we already have a mortgage. So this, and as far as, the only reason I'm doing this, honestly, is because I have a lot of old clients who are asking to purchase wine. And um, I'm constantly telling them to go somewhere else to buy it. So I thought that it would be economically beneficial to myself to get a liquor license and sell it to them myself. Okay. So um, at some point, I'd love to get a store, but at this point, it's not economically sound for me. And I have a full-time job, and uh, so this is a part-time thing for me. It's just because I love it. So your diagram, you uh, list what's entitled house storage space. Mm -hmm. Is that interior storage space then? Yeah, it's all inside. Nothing will be outside. And, and the reason I ask whether you're RC3 or RP2 is I guess under my reading of the ordinance, we don't have, we're, we don't have a position, uh, the ability to grant a conditional use permit under RP2 because it's home businesses are outright permitted under oh. RP2. Oh. Um, but it remains to be seen how the board views the ordinance and whether RP2 is an overlay or a standalone district. 
So if it was RP2, this would be moot and we'd be allowed to do it? Is that uh, my understanding? My individual view, yes, but we have to hear from the rest of the board. Oh, okay. Thank you. I do want to just touch on that. I know that several of our um, neighbors have commented on the, their concern about traffic, which I understand. I have two small children and two dogs. And um, Spurwink is a busy road, but what we're an anticipating is, is not going to add enough that would be a significant amount to add to concern for it. So. Any other? I, I think I'm good. Unless um, you want to say if the CEO has some comments, and then otherwise I'll open it up for a couple comments from the neighbors to the extent anyone wanted to make a comment. Yeah, if I could just address your point. With, with Please do. Yeah. I, I, I think you raise a valid point. There is some ambiguity in the ordinance as to whether the RP2 would be considered the zone or an overlay zone. Uh, but there really isn't an avenue in the zoning ordinance for me to permit a home business. Uh, so the intent, I think the intent of the chart in, in the RP2 is to say that it is allowed in that zone, but I, I, the permitting authority still lies with the Board of Appeals, but I, I understand that's not completely clear the, the, the way that's written, but I, don't ha I wouldn't have any permitting standards to go by if it was left in my hands to permit. So I, I still think the intent of the ordinance, whether clear or not, is for the Board of Appeals to hear this. Well, and what's the change? It goes with the deed, it goes to the next buyer of the house when you do a change like this? If, if it's a conditional use grant or if it's... What, we're, what they're requesting, if we grant that, does that stay with the house with the next buyer? I, um, it does, doesn't it? I would assume so, but I cannot comment affirmatively either way, <laughs> but I'm not serving the role of a lawyer up here. No, no, so. yeah, <laughs> it's part of it. The way I'm thinking, it's not just for nice people, it could be for bad people, the, fu the future buyers of the house. It would be, unfor unfortunately, it would basically be a question for the town attorney if he was here. Say that again? It, that, uh, that's a question for the town attorney if he was here, unfortunately, or the CEO. So. Okay. <laughs> And uh, with that, uh, if any, I would first off note for the record, we received a couple emails from people in the neighborhood that we're just going to, we're going to admit to the record. I assume you're aware of them. And then if there's any uh, abutters who want to make a brief comment, we can limit it to five minutes. Oh, all right. Um, with that, oh, if, if you're interested in making a comment, please come up to the microphone. So, sorry, can you, uh, if you can come up to the microphone. We, we've now heard from the applicants. I want, I just mentioned for the record, we're accepting into the record some emails we've received, just so those are now officially in the record. Now, if you would like to make a, uh, any additional comments, uh, we'll take up to five minutes of comments well, at this point. One thing I would like to just to respond to that is that the information that was sent to you from other people, is that not brought out here? Or you just Oh, uh, it, it's officially part of the record. record. Um, we can read, I mean, otherwise we just would read them out loud, but we're, I would just note that we've received comments from some of the abutters who are opposed to the application. Mm -hmm. uh, did th because there were more than just emails. Uh, personally, uh, we wrote hello. specific questions and concerns and I feel that they should be addressed at the meeting and we should get answers to the questions we asked. So uh, I was going, my comment was simply to go through the process to officially make them part of the record. We will have a discussion after oh, okay. comments okay. are received. Okay. We'll then discuss. I was misunderstanding yeah, yeah, yeah. that. So. Um, because I do, I don't know if I agree totally what Jennifer has proposed in saying that there will not be an addition to traffic and on one hand that there will be at least or up to 10 deliveries from trucks every day and that part time the hours she has written is Sunday by appointment only. 
I don't know what the appointments would be if you're doing something by email. And Monday through Saturday from 10 to 7 p.m., that's to me seven days a week of running a part-time business. I mean, if it's all on the internet and email, that's possible. But with deliveries and customers and people coming to the home, um, I don't see it as part-time. And I do have a real big opposition to it being a retail business for alcohol on our, in a residential area. And if I can ask, uh, do you have a precedent for this in Cape Elizabeth? Is there another one that's like this that you have in Cape Elizabeth in a residential area? My knowledge only goes back for my period of time on the board, and we've had, we have not had that many it would be helpful to uh, know that so. from both sides of the fence because it could be helpful for them, it could be helpful for us to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. It does seem like it should be a business that's operating in a business area. I agree with the gentleman that says a store, a bar, a restaurant, but not in a home. It's, it's difficult for us because um, it's a retail business, a retail business that deals in controlled substances. And that always worries us. Uh, we've been in other towns where there have been, you know, even into the stores, major break-ins. Uh, I think what we already said this to Jennifer uh, about worried about the criminal element coming in because of this, and uh, the fact that they would put it in alarms and everything else would probably be helpful. But once again, it's a residential business. Um, retail. Uh, the other businesses that are there, I don't believe are retail, they are service. So it, it's a balance, it's a little bit hard for us. We're worried about the traffic. We are also worried about the presence of that much alcohol. I'm not against alcohol, believe me. Uh, but uh, the presence of that much alcohol, the word gets out, I'd worry about what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, we'll see if there are any other comments, and then I'll give you an opportunity to respond, and then we'll close the record. Right. And uh, again, we're trying to limit it to five minutes, so if you could, in total, so if you could keep it brief. Frank Hannigan, 233 Smark Avenue. You folks all received my email on this, I believe. Um, I'm not going to reiterate everything that I sent to you as well. I didn't know it involved beer as well. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about this. Uh, it, it just does not seem right. I know about the, uh, the therapist that they speak of, their neighbor. She went up here. She came to this board. She had to make several changes and adjustments and able to, uh, for her to open her uh, business to her clients. And uh, she spent a lot of money doing it. <clears throat> uh, but I look at this as just a totally different ball game. We're in a whole... It almost thinks that if this works, then I can clean out my front yard and put in nine parking spots in a variety store. That's, that's how I'm looking at it. And I've lived here a long time. And uh, this, just, uh, this is getting a little carried away over there. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, if you wanted to make any final comments before we close the record. Yeah, I just want to... Um Reiterate, it's not a retail store. It's not going to be a retail store. It's going to be no foot traffic. The reason the operation hours I put on there were for email purchases and the by appointment only are um, my vendors and distributors. We've already discussed with them that it would only be van delivery only. It would be one day a week. We're concerned parents. We live on that street. We know about the traffic. We're not going to add to it. We're, we're going to be very cautious and cognizant of our neighbors. And it's, like I said, it's not a retail store. People are not going to be coming up to our house to purchase things from our house. It's, going, it's not a retail store. <laughs> I just want to put that there. Um, and I think um, I'm correct in stating that 
um, my wife um, uh, by law and I think Maine just changed um, their laws in being able to do this over the internet. And so this is probably why it hasn't been done in Cape Elizabeth in or in the state. So that, that's, uh, there's no previous history on this. So basically it's, uh, we would like to run a, uh, a s small wine internet business that we ship out of, out of a office in the back of our house, um, which is allowed by the state. Um, the amount of traffic um, might be a concern for our neighbors, but we're also allowed a specific amount of trips into our driveway. Um, our driveway is also designed for any vans to pull in, and also we have a side area that they can turn around on, so there won't be any um, anything blocking traffic out on Spurlink, although um, all the trucks previously that stop FedEx and UPS for our neighbors and ourselves decide to stop on the street um, and not pull into any of our driveways. So I don't know if that would be an issue. Yeah, yeah. so thanks. Thank you. Okay. So can we ask? Uh, yeah, to the extent we have any questions, yes. I, I just, so the, the traffic to the house would only be beer and wine distributors dropping off beer and wine at your house and then also shipping companies such as FedEx picking it, would it up be, at your house? It would be UPS because FedEx won't do it. They have to have a uh, signature for, for state mandated and FedEx doesn't do it. So it would be UPS truck which already comes all the time on that road and it would be uh, distributors and distributors would have times that they could do it of delivery and it would be certain days and we would not even get the 10 trips per day that were allowed it because I wouldn't have the time so would you be comfortable with a limit in any permit that or approval that were to come out tonight with a limit that's lower than the 10 per day uh -huh. understanding of course that 10 per day means five five yes a pool in and a pool out. because one in and one out each counts my concern, my only concern would be that here, this was something my husband and I were saying, is uh, we already have a lot of people come in and out of our house. We entertain a lot. I, I'm a sommelier, so we have a lot of dinner parties. We have, I have a lot of family in the area, so how, how do we even know, you know what I mean? How do you even know, like, what is the business and what is not the business? And my concern is that our neighbors seem to be a little bit worried already and how is that going to make them feel better I mean I that's fine with me I um, I we can try to do that but I just worry about the concern already I guess um, specifically about vans okay or anything like that like the that. shipping trucks yeah 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 that's fine I'm, um, I might, let's see, I'm trying to think of, yeah, we could, I mean, I could, I'd be comfortable with um, six, I guess, three, three trips. How do you I could do that. that. I mean, I know, I, that's right. you don't believe <laughs> it, but it's in the, part of the Say it again? we can talk about that in discussion. Okay, okay that's a point. Any other questions from the board for the applicant? Is there a, a name that's going to be on the, the main license? Is that going to be your or your husband's name, or is there? We're both on the name. We're, we're, it's, we're already an LLC. I, and, and what's the name of the company that will be running the business? The name of the company is Flock and Vine, and it's already. Um, it, it's we're not going to have any signage or anything be, for the very reason it's not a retail store. So there's no, going to be no sign, no advertising to come to our to our place of business. Because it's an internet store. Um, so the, the, the true entity in, that's in, in interest in this application is the company. Mm -hmm. And that you're an agent operating. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? I was about to close the record. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> Go ahead. Although, I, I, technically, as a board member, I, I, I can't advise you one way or the other. It's for the town attorney. But I would question. Uh, it, it's up to you if you want to make a comment or not. But I, being a board member, it might be best if you did not make a public comment on the issue. If you've recused yourself from the issue in its entirety. But I don't know the propriety one way or the other. Yeah. Um, just for clarity, I, I think that since he recused himself from, as a board member, he's still a citizen, then if he would like to speak, that we should uh, take deference for him to speak. Uh, it's not an issue for us to recuse him from speaking. That's the point that I wanted to just, just imagine a yeah. situation where he was applying for a variance or something. He obviously. Like I said, I'm, I don't know one way or the other the propriety, so. Yes. And then the, the also, the, we can caution him to temper the comments. But uh, as a citizen, I think he should speak if he wishes to speak. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> So with that, I'll close the record and open uh, the discussion. Um, as a jurisdictional issue, could we get to the bottom as to whether this is in or out of a particular area on the map? And if it's in or out, that would probably dictate a has the further discussion. I completely agree with you. Does anyone else have any opinions as to um, the zoning of this property? It seems like, at least for me, the issue is whether the resource protection districts are overlays. And this, again, goes somewhat harkens back to what we had last month, uh, unfortunately. And I would note that we have the RP1CW, RP1CW buffer overlay, and then the RP2WP, RP3F. And although I understand interpreting them as overlays and that makes sense. I don't necessarily see any language saying that these are intended to be overlays. What page are you, what page are you on? Uh, section 1969 is the resource protection, and again, it's districts. And we have one that's called a buffer overlay, but the what others are not. Is that on, on yours? My version, it's about 128. And I can definitely be swayed that if someone can articulate an argument as to why these are overlays. Well, did we confirm? Never mind. My reading of the zoning map places it in the light green next to the orange, the orange indicating RC. Uh, so it's, it appears to me that it's clearly an RP2. And I don't think that, I think the CEO agreed with that. I think the CEO's interpretation was that it's an overlay district. Correct. And the reason, of course, that it would matter is my reading of then table 1969 with permitted indicates that it's a permitted use, not a conditional use. It sounds like the CEO's interpretation would be permitted means that it's permitted for us to grant a permit in it. Yeah, but then permitted, you have to look at those other standards, which are all planning board standards. I guess it doesn't make sense to me that it wouldn't be an overlay district when the critical wetland buffer district is clearly an overlay district. The, the, uh, Why would you have a separate district? So you would, you, 
are of the opinion that it, the RP2 is not an overlay district or it is an overlay district? It is an overlay district. And the problem I have is that subsec of 1969A subsection 2 is called an overlay district and none of the others are. No, I see that. But it just doesn't make sense for not for all of them not to be. Like, you would not normally have just a floodplain district without some underlying <coughs> zoning for it. Um, and if you were to use that reading, then you would never have a situation where the code enforcement officer could issue a permit in those areas. Everything would have to go for everything that's permitted would have to go to the planning board which doesn't seem rational. It, it says it's permitted by right, but it has to be in accord with the planning board standards. Where do you see that permitted means it has to be in accordance with planning board standards as opposed to outright allowed? Um, it, if you look at page, what's on mine is page 130. It's right under the text for where it says table 19-6-9 uses permitted allowed with a resource protection permitted prohibited in the resource protection districts. Uh, then it understood. lists permitted RPP and no and defines what those mean. And for permitted it says indicates uses that are permitted by right subject to section 19-8-3 resource protection performance standards which are all planning board standards. And which are pretty onerous. So under that argument, permitted would require it to go to the planning board rather than us. I don't know that it would need to go to the planning board, but it would certainly need to be in compliance with all of those standards. And it wouldn't come to us. If, CEO, if you have a, a point to make. Uh, if we went with the theory that, the R, that it's not in the RC district, someone could argue that they wouldn't have to have a front setback on their house, because front setbacks are only found in, in the base zone setbacks. So I, so I don't think that works with the general context of the zoning ordinance to try to say that the RC district doesn't apply. What basis do we have to believe that it's RC and not RA? That it overlays. All, all, all the surrounding lots are RC that are that, that surround that lot. But one could easily argue the other way that the RA abuts the other right across the street there, and therefore, Boy. for all we know, there's a branch of RA that extends yeah, all, in. All of the small lots directly across the street are RC, and... Uh, <clears throat> Does it matter? Are home businesses permitted differently in RA than RC? No. Okay, so it doesn't really matter. RA is also conditional use then for home business? Yes, right. it is. Great. Um, I, also want to, I also want to put a marker down here that the home business is a defined term that we should just check on that point when we're finished with the jurisdictional point. You want to talk? Chris, I think someone wants to talk in the back. Uh, we, uh, we, at the we, end we, of public comments? Yeah, we technically closed uh, public comments at this point. Um, we did? Okay unless someone wants to move to reopen the record to public comments. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second it as well. 
I will second the motion for public okay. open for this one particular person. Right, uh, vote to reopen then. All in favor? Hi, my name is Carol Ann Christ, and I'm a resident of Pleasant Avenue around the corner. And I don't know if these people realize it, but we haven't been able to sell liquor that long in Cape Elizabeth, period. And uh, my question of concern is the wholesale aspect of your business. If you were going to sell wholesale, that would be like to liquor stores and stuff? Who would that be to individuals? Wine? Well, wine. Whatever, but where are you going to store all this? Uh, Ma'am, technically your comments are supposed to be directed to the board as opposed to... Okay, the, well my um, question would be, with the, uh, is where are they going to store all these things, all, all, all the stuff that they're selling? Certainly not in a small office. Are they going to have to have a separate van in which this stuff is housed? A according to the application, to the extent that the board decided to grant the application, they'd be restricted to keeping it all within the building. Do you believe that? Under the application, they would have to be. If they didn't, then it would potentially be a violation the CEO would step in and deal with. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, uh, I, I, I just feel having lived in Cape Elizabeth for my, most of my lifetime, and we just barely granted the stores selling liquor, that to have a wholesale liquor store in the neighborhood would not be a good thing. Sorry. Thank you. And with that, we'll reclose the record. Any comments from the board? Oh, uh, did, ready did, to vote or where are we? Oh, oh I, I, did we? I think the first issue, as uh, uh, Matt noted, um, is the jurisdictional issue. Yes, we, we were yeah. still determining that, uh, and hopefully we have a collective idea as to the particular point. Any other comments? Anyone want to make a motion as to the jurisdictional issue? As to what? Uh, so the, the initial uh, gating issue to decide whether we even have the authority to even consider granting a conditional use permit is whether um, we have the power under the ordinance. In order for us to determine we have power under the ordinance, um, we have to make, figure out which district the property lies in. And do we have the knowledge to do that? So we have a zoning map that's color-coded, and this property is colored as RP2. It's adjacent to the north and the west with what are colored orange RC district properties. It is adjacent the southeast with RA properties and other RP2 properties. So the question is, is RP2 intended to be an overlay district so that there's really RC3 underlying it? <laughs> or is RP2 a standalone district? That's very clear, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my only concern is I don't see any language indicating that RP2 who is a overlay district. And Joanna's point is that looking at the ordinance as a whole, it would only make sense that it was an overlay district. Just to clarify, sorry, just to clarify one point uh, on the, even with my glasses on, um, the color coding is either orange or light green. And um, if I'm reading it correctly, the, the orange is more of a commercial based um, zoning, whereas the light green is, is more residential. 
And we're talking about one lot on either side. I, I, uh, live, as a resident of the Orange, I would disagree with that assessment. <laughs> um, <laughs> Our RC3 is the, uh, what I would characterize as the traditional, highly developed areas of Cape Elizabeth where the original subdivisions went, back in, went in back in the 1900s. So it's heavily residential. Uh, I stand corrected. Thank you for clarification. Thank you. The, um, the pink or the purple are the business districts in town, which Thank for the most part are restricted to the center of town, a very small uh, location in the northeastern part of town, and then a small region in the southern part of town, which is why, at least from my perspective, the ability to bring a business in anywhere else is a conditional use. Wait, what is your read? If, so if we were to conclude that this is not an overlay district, and that it is a freestanding district in which home businesses are a use permitted by right so long as they comply with the standards that are applicable in the RP2 zone. That then means they don't go to the planning board, they don't go to the code enforcement officer, they don't come to us, they do what they want as long as they are in compliance with those standards. Is that right? I have not parsed out the implications of the decision. I simply did a textual read and said it doesn't say it's an overlay district. Yeah. If you look at section 19-2-1 zoning districts, it's on page 23 of my ordinance. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Joanna's point is that uh, I'll summarize. Correct me if I get any of this wrong. The first sec uh, article two of our ordinance entitled "Establishment of Districts" as section nineteen two one entitled "Zoning Districts." That explicitly states that the the town is divided into a list of districts and three specific overlay districts. One of the districts is RP2, indicating that RP2 is not an overlay district. It is a standalone district. Meaning? Uh, my, and this is just my opinion, uh, is that we don't have the authority to grant a conditional use permit here. Can they do what they wish or do they have to go to planning board? I don't know if that's the issue before us right now. <laughs> the issue before us is whether we can grant a conditional use permit. Um, and can I, we? And you say no. My personal opinion would be no, it's not listed as a conditional use in this district. Where's the town council? We need them. <laughs> we need them. And so that, that's because in this district, there's, there's just no provisions there's, for conditional use. For example, if we instead turn to any of the other districts, almost all of them will, the R R A R B R C say, that home businesses are conditional use, which then triggers the part of the ordinance where we have to analyze whether conditional use permit should be granted. But if you were to look at page um, uh, on my ordinance, it's 132, it's table 19 6 9. It lists the uses that are permitted in the RP zone. Those lists, right, including the RP2, which is where we think this is located, and it includes home occupation and home business as a permitted use. 17. Right. And again, and then you go back to the beginning of that, and permitted is, indicates uses that are permitted by right, subject to section 1983 resource protection performance standards. Which, seems to indicate that that then goes to the planning board, not us. Permitted by right, as long as it's compliant with 198-3. Although 1983A1B seems to indicate that there's a review process by the planning board. Hold on. That's 1983, subsection A1, review, then subsection B. You give a general page. Uh, 195. And what was the subsection again? 1983, subsection A, uh, sub... But that's for stuff that's listed as permitted with an RPP. 
So if you look at that same table, 19-6-9, it says RPP indicates uses that are permitted provided an R resource protection permit is issued in accordance with Section 19-8-3. That's not what that list use is listed Very as a permitted point. use. Yep. I mean, so there's nothing in here about a permit or any approval. Deja vu from last month for me. Can I make a recommendation? If, if, the, board, if the board is going to find that they don't have jurisdiction here, I, I don't think the board should go further explaining where the jurisdiction lies or how that permit is obtained. Agreed. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. Sorry, so, wait. Yes, I, guess, I agree as well. <laughs> I'd, I, um, I'd make, uh, I'll, I'll make a motion here. Uh, I move that we. Uh, Bef oh, can I interrupt before we Please. do? Yes. Yes. Um, the underlying issue is one of fact that being whether this district whether this property is in the rc zone or the rp2 zone and um i guess i'm a little bit reluctant to decide <laughs> um to um We don't have all the all of the information that we have in the application indicates that it's in the RC zone. I, I would uh, respectfully, unfortunately, disagree with it. Primarily based on your observation about 1921, in that it's laid out as districts. And right, except for that, the only information that we have that says that it's in the RP2 is the color. I guess on the map we have the we have the lot and the lot is where it is in the town yes but how do we know where it is oh uh, we have the the notice indicates exactly where the lot lies it's um right but that doesn't tell us what zone it's in but then we have the zoning map that's simply part of our that's part of our ordinance so are we putting facts in the record about the location of the property, or is the applicant? Well, the, the applicant applied based on a particular lot, which lies at a particular location in town. And then I would argue that the zoning map itself is simply part of the ordinance, and that just is always something that's part of the record. Uh, I will also chime in here that on the application, the district is identified as RC. So there's a, uh, a material fact that's at, at issue, uh, notwithstanding, because that's the gateway to determine whether we have jurisdiction on this particular issue. Hmm. I guess to my mind, it's kind of like a title question. You know, it's not for us to make um, factual determines, determinations or determinations of law about underlying title issues. Is it within our purview to make independent um, determinations about whether a property is or is not in a zone? And I would feel uncomfortable setting the precedent of taking um, whatever an applicant has put in at face value for what district they're in. I feel no. we have an independent obligation to ensure the accuracy of what's in the application. So I guess with that, I would propose uh, an initial finding of fact that the property lies in the RP2, or yeah, the RP2 district. There is second. I need a couple more minutes to look at the map. I'm sorry. If Fair I'm enough. I'll, I'll look. Draw the, I don't even know where it is. <laughs> we'll withdraw the proposed motion for the time being. Yes, sir. 
Mars and rain. Still discussing. Uh, we're, we're in a holding pattern. Uh, well, there's someone to print a motion. Is there a notice requirement to notify the abutters of an of a additional use permit? Yes. And that has been complied with? Yes. You have a copy of it? Yes, I do. So, I, okay. I mean, so I mean, this isn't an appeal of the code enforcement officer's decision. Correct. And, and the code enforcement officer determined that this is in RC. This is in the RC zone. Correct. Did you make a actual determination? Did you make it in the RC zone. Uh, I I fact checked the application and agreed with the applicant that it's in the RC zone. I mean, our, our job here is not to be questioning that determination. I would submit. <laughs> so you would say that it's a factual determination made by the CEO, which is entitled to deference unless it's clearly erroneous and therefore we should make a finding that it's in our seat? I don't hear anybody challenging that. There's been no appeal from that. It's, this is the determination. This is the, I mean, this is what's before us. It's a conditional use permit in an RC zone, and the CEO has checked that and said it's in an RC zone. So I, I, I mean, I understand that the issue that was raised and looking at the map, what may or may not appear where it is, but I don't we believe that is, that is the board's purview right now to be checking that. And, and we can definitely, if you want to make a motion on that, although I would counter that we do have an independent obligation to make sure that the application is correct. And if it's... No, we don't. Not on the facts. If an application comes in, I personally think we, we have an independent obligation to verify that the, the district that the property lies in is... It's the code enforcement officer's job. The, the what? Oh, yes. Can you repeat that? Uh, to my mind, it's the code enforcement officer's job to tell us what zone it's in. It's not our job to figure out yes, you're right about what zone it's in, or no, you're wrong about what zone it's in. That's a question of fact that has been put forward by the applicant. The code enforcement officer agreed with it and put it forward to us. Our job is to review what we have in the materials and decide whether it complies with the ordinance or not. But aren't there cases like this we need input from the town council? I mean, no one here is a municipal uh, law specialist. I presume that the town council is. But I mean, just to accept as fact something like that, I, I think it's kind of a reach, only because I can't make that decision. I'm not an attorney. I need in input from town council. I mean, that's just my, my, my opinion. Sorry, let me add one more point. So that this gets back to the jurisdictional problem. We are here because there's an application for conditional use. It's not an appeal on a decision made by the CEO. If that was the case, that we would have de novo complete re reviewing capability uh, to do so. So we'll get back to the gateway as the jurisdictional point is that we're here for an application on conditional use on a belief that it's uh, RC, not uh, RP2. From our discussions, it now appears that that is incorrect. And if it is RC, we now have to determine Yes, we do have jurisdiction, assuming that we do a vote on that, that's the determination. Uh, and then that's the answer. Although it's a quirky conclu conclu uh, conclusion to reach, actually. Well, I, see, I, I mean, you're saying it's a jurisdictional issue whether or not this is, it, RC is the correct zone? No, I believe that is a material issue of fact that's um, not correct. Sorry. That's a material issue of fact. 
the, jur the way that we have the jurisdiction to deal with this application is through the doorway of conditional use, a permit for conditional use. And then that issue has to be determined whether um, this application meets that test or not, and then it goes away. That, that's, the end, that's the end of the inquiry. We are then also saying that, hold on, we, for us to determine that question, we have to determine correctly the, um, the zoning, is that right? The, uh, which uh, zoning it is going to be. And I guess this, this, it's almost like a chicken and egg problem. Yeah, I mean, and and the, way I, the way I'm seeing it, I mean, I, I haven't committed exactly one way or the other, but we're being asked to review this conditional use permit and an assumption that we are being given is that it is in the RC. If it's not, that's another issue, but I don't think that's for us. I think we should review this as a conditional use permit as this, I mean, that, I, I think that's, that's what the application is. And for us to, to now go and start questioning where it is, that's for somebody else to do. I think, I, I disagree with that. I guess we just have a fundamental disagreement on that point. Um, I mean, we can continue the debate on it. Are we ready to kind of vote on that issue if someone can put together a motion on it so we can move forward? I'm sorry, I just want to clear. This is, um, uh, <coughs> I'll make this clear, hopefully clear. The only reason that the board has the jurisdiction to hear this is because the ordinance says that when someone within a particular zone seeks a home business has to go to the zoning board. And that uh, on the application, as well as conferring by the CEO, it is RC. So the question, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there as well. Uh, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to move that we consider this application as presented as an application for conditional use home business in the RC zone subject to our jurisdiction. I'll second that. All in favor? Abstain. Uh, all opposed? Are you, are you, I'm sorry, are you I think it was three. He said he was abstaining. And, and then, then he voted, yeah. Okay. okay. So three, two, I vote. Okay. Okay. With that, the board uh, has now considered this property to be for purposes of this application into in the RC district. And with that, I guess we can move on to the merits of the conditional use application. So any discussion on the merits of the application? I mean, now we should be starting with determining whether or not it meets the definition of home business. I'm just trying to map this out for the board. I, I would propose that we begin by uh, considering the criteria that need to be evaluated in order, to, as you noted, uh, to determine whether A, it qualifies as a home business, and then if it does qualify as a home business, then step through the criteria for qualifying for a conditional use permit. I would agree. Sounds. Uh, Chair, for the record, could you um, confirm the section in the ordinance that we're now talking about that talks about the, the conditional use permit, and then we'll go to the definition uh, section. So you want to start with uh, the conditional use permit the, first? The, yes. So conditional use permits are under section 1955, but first under 1963 for residential district C. which is approximately page 70 for me. Uh, under 19.3, or 19.6.3, subsection C, entitled Conditional Uses, it says the following uses may be permitted only upon approval by the ZBA as a conditional use in accordance with 19.55. And you'll see under subsection 3, the following accessory uses, A, home business. Oh, 
open business is defined in section 1922, I think. Correct. On page, roughly page nine of my ordinance. 19-1-3, sorry. And so a home business is defined as a business or professional use that is more intensive than a home occupation and which is conducted within or from a dwelling unit by an occupant of the dwelling unit. The use may also be conducted within an accessory structure, um, which existed as of April 1st, 1998. The business or professional use shall be accessory to the primary residential use. Uh, which is the first implicit criteria there. A home business shall comply with all of the following criteria. And um, we then have seven criteria to step through as uh, Mr. Carver noted. We should probably step through and find out if all seven criteria are met. Accessory use is also a defined term which requires that a use, that that use be a use that is incidental and subordinate to the principal use the principal use shall not become subordinate to accessory uses when aggregated. So uh, with that, uh, any discussion or comment um, on that first kind of implicit criteria that the business be accessory to the primary use? I would just say that it sounds like it, it is from what we've heard. It's certainly the area of the, the floor, the total floor area that's shown on the application is under 20%. Uh, it's roughly 14%, which is consistent with it being accessory. And the amount of time that um, is proposed for use also appears to be consistent. And with that, moving on to number one, uh, as indicated in the application, uh, criteria number one says not more than one person who is not a resident shall be involved or employed on the premises in the business or professional use. And the application says there will be no one employed who's not a resident. So I think that one's no dispute. Number two, the nature. Excuse me. Um, sure. I don't believe the, it's assumed that that is the case. Uh, this may be, I'm sorry. It may be assumed that the facts that would support that subparagraph one is in the record. This, their application indicates that there will be no one who is not a resident that will be employed. So the, uh, to, the, to the extent they violate that restriction, they'd be in violation of the granting of the... Yep. The, 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 the conditional use permit would be, uh, my understanding is, would be covered by what they've, they've filled out. And to the extent they deviate from it, they would then be in violation of the conditional use permit. So number two, the uh, any other comment on number one? Number two, the nature of the business or professional use shall not increase vehicular traffic on the street by more than 2% of the current average daily traffic or 10 trips, whichever is larger. So here, 2% is approximately uh, actually 74, it looks like. So I think uh, it seems beyond dispute number two is met. Their application <coughs> indicates that they anticipate three to 10 vehicle trips per day. Which would be less than 74. Yep. Yeah. Uh, number three, the business or professional use shall not produce any odors, fumes, dust, glare, noise, or electrical interference in excess of that produced by a normal residential use. And they've indicated no. We've, does anyone have any comment, any reason to disbelieve what's been presented here? There's nothing in the record that indicates that either from the public comment or from the application that there are any issues regarding odors, fumes, dust, glare, noise. That move on to number four. Any ex 
internal alteration of the building or site, including the provision of parking in accordance with <coughs> section 1978 off street parking shall not detract from the residential character of the neighborhood. Understanding the application is they've represented the only exterior change is an outside entrance to the back room. On page two, um, item number four. Any other comments? No. So number five, the square footage occupied by the business or professional use shall occupy an area no greater than 20% of the floor area of the structure as defined above of the dwelling unit. And as previously discussed, uh, it's represented that it's going to be 14% maximum. So I think it's beyond dispute that criteria is met. Uh, number six, all signs shall comply with the sign ordinance and the application says there will be no sign. Number seven, there should be no outdoor storage of equipment or materials. And as part of the uh, comment period, the applicant indicated that what's marked as house storage space on the drawing is all interior storage and that there's no exterior storage. Any other questions? comments or discussion regarding uh, whether the application meets the definition of home business. Other than it, it sounds like we have established that it does. Right. So I'd propose we move on to the conditional use determination, 19.55. And um, subsection, first off, subsection C, application requirements. Um, we have an application form. My understanding is the fee has been paid. Location of the use is indicated. Description of the use appears to have been indicated in the application, including the nature of the use square footage, hours of operation, type and amount of pollutants generated, types and amount of traffic expected to be generated. We have a drawing, uh, which appears to meet all of the required criteria. Any discussion of the drawing? And with that, then I'd say we should probably turn to subsection D for the standards for conditional use approval. The first criteria of which is uh, whether any conditions uh, prescribed for such conditional use will be satisfied. Any discussion or comment? Well, I think that, that kind of invites a discussion as to whether there should be some conditions prescribed um, as permitted by the ordinance under Section E. And those would include off-site street improvements, <coughs> access restrictions, hours of operation, buffering and screening, utility improvements, and performance guarantees. And, and uh, you know, one comment or one thought that I have on that is in terms of the hours of use, I know there was some discussion about you know, hours on Sunday by appointment. I, I don't really know if, if it's basically for deliveries and for shipping. I don't even know if that's necessary. Um, for there to be hours on a Sunday to operate the business other than responding to orders via email. But any traffic, I, I don't know if that's really necessary on a Sunday. And I guess I have a similar kind of inclination that it seems like restricting the hours to just during the week hours um, 
makes the, the application a little uh, more uh, acceptable for me than it would be otherwise. And, and I guess... What Do you mean for truck traffic? Exact, exactly. Or yeah. delivery traffic? If you have a UPS trucks or a delivery trucks coming in, first off, three a day seems a little high to me, but we'll get to that. Um, and then to the extent that it's you have trucks coming in and out, it makes sense to have them occur Monday to Friday during normal business hours. I sometimes get three at my house. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have a business. So I'm not even there. I, I guess my only question would Fair be with, with respect to normal business hours. I mean, I, I do just from experience sometimes get a you know UPS delivery after 5 p.m. And it may be a little bit difficult to control mm -hmm. when UPS makes its deliveries or its pickups. And, and I understand the hours went till 7. I'd hate to impose a restriction that mm -hmm. can't then, be complied with exactly. by something that's outside of your power. And, and again, if it's limited to three a day, this, it's not like between 6 and 7, there's going to be a lot of trucks coming in and out of. I guess I would be, um, I, it seems relatively reasonable to me to limit or or say that you know truck deliveries or on Sundays are unnecessary but um, I don't I, it doesn't seem to me that limiting the hours of operation of the business for truck deliveries to a schedule that doesn't comply with whatever it is that UPS and FedEx and the other delivery companies do is a reasonable restriction because if that's the only time they do it, then that's, right. yeah, you, you can't make them come at a different time. I, I guess for, for me, at the end of the day, um, now that we've, did, for the purposes of this uh, application, determined it's RC3, I guess as a resident of R3, RC3, RC3, or I keep saying RC3, R, uh, RC, uh, District RC, they really tend to be homes that are very closely built together, very built up areas of town where you have setbacks where your neighbor is three feet from you five feet from you it's not like ra or rb so i'm hesitant to even allow a, a conditional use business in unless it's really clear that there's not going to be impact on the neighbors so as we start talking about we're oh well uh, deliveries are they coming in at seven o'clock how many trucks are coming in it's like the moment i hear truck it already seems like it's going to have a significant impact on the neighborhood. Well, and, but it, of course, what we're talking about are in terms of trucks, and I guess we have to separate the, you know, UPS truck picking up orders, which are then being delivered, versus the suppliers showing up. Mm -hmm. I think UPS trucks are in neighborhoods regularly, every day, multiple times a day. Uh, you know, on a day that I'm at home on a Monday, I see a UPS truck at least once a day. So I don't think it, 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 to me, it wouldn't really be increasing the number of brown trucks going by. So I, I think you, you do make a, a, what's a good point for me, which is that the, if it's a UPS truck, that's distinct from when I imagine the big liquor truck pulling up with all the kegs and everything. And I, and I believe going. that they were going to, they voluntarily said that they would restrict it to vans for the delivery from the supplier. So, and, and what I then envision is, you know, uh, a, a van, not a truck, which again is pretty consistent with what's driving around. I mean, it's not, it, no 18 wheelers are going to be pulling up or even, you know, U Haul truck size trucks. Yeah, I'm not picturing like the Michelob truck <laughs> pulling up and whipping up the cape, but maybe it's wrong. May I, I mean, I'm picturing like what I see at my house. You get the UPS guy that comes at whatever, one o'clock, and then you get later in the afternoon, you get the FedEx truck, and, and maybe I get my groceries delivered that day, and you've got someone in a van. And that may be the case, but I would at least suggest that we tailor the, if a permit were to be issued, it be tailored to make sure that the reality matches that. Um, I wanted to follow up on that point. I, I think that may be an area where we can uh, have some, I'll label it under performance guarantees, is that there's a time period where this might come back to us. I'll come back to whoever's going to have jurisdiction over this to see if this is going to work or not, assuming that we vote on it. Because I'm, I'm not comfortable the way that we are currently sitting at this moment. We are where we are. We're working through the, the conditions for approval. 
I think that we should be taking an opportunity to have this as a test period of time, come up with whatever conditions for approval is required, including the size of the vans, whether there's hours of operation. One that, we've, one that we haven't talked about, but was raised by the public, is that this should not be a mini mart. This should not. This should be a particular <coughs> type of product to a particular type of clientele. If we're saying that hard alcohol or beer, including wine, um, maybe that's a little further afield than we're uh, comfortable with approving. Uh, but those are a couple options that we can. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I, I certainly would think a condition of approval would be that there can be no retail sales to people visiting the house under any condition. So the only sales would be via outgoing UPS deliveries. I mean, it, it's not, it's not a, it's, people cannot show up, even if they've ordered it via email, they can't then show up at the property to pick it up even. It's got to so be. The, the distribution only, mechanism would be a, a third party commercial pick up and drop off. Exactly. I mean, I think that that's an important restriction, and I believe that's that's what the applicants have already suggested. But I think that it's an important condition that um, there there can be no, you know, retail purchasers. It has to be by a, a third party delivery, and, and I, I would probably go. I, I think we have to be careful about that because I wouldn't want them then to be able to employ you know somebody in a van who just comes and picks up and then starts driving around Cape Elizabeth and South Portland delivering what people have ordered. I think this is a mail order business. And to me, mail order means it is going out via UPS or some commercial carrier, not a delivery van. When you say, com when you say conditional, do you mean give this approval only for like a one year period? And that's one possibility. Is that legal? Can we do that? You can do a conditional use? Uh I'm, Only one year? I'm not uh, aware of us being able to set a time restriction. And I would note that the application itself indicates that the goal is delivery service to the greater Portland area, as well as shipping via UPS to clients outside the local market, which implies that it's more than just the UPS vehicles. It, well, it, I would. Can well, we. Do we want to reopen the record for any comments? Yeah, I would. I would like. I mean, I, I'd like to. Do a motion. Yeah, you make a motion to reopen. I'd like to make a motion to reopen the floor for the applicants for comment, oh, further okay. clarification. Can you answer my question? Can we do a conditional for one year, for example? Is that within our province? We don't. Ben. Yeah, <clears throat> under the conditions section, it, it lists six possible conditions, but above that it says these conditions may include but are not limited to. So I do think the zoning ordinance leaves it open for you to put any conditions on it that you choose. And that would convince me. Wait, 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 it was seconded, so all in favor? Okay, opposed? Abstain. <laughs> With that. And, and I guess just the, the question is right. for the deliveries in the local Portland area. Right, we were thinking that um, for, and this has been discussion between my husband and I, that it would be he or I in our personal vehicle to the greater Portland and, and Cape Elizabeth that if it didn't seem economically sound to UPS ship it, that we would put it in our car and drive it to them. No foot traffic at our house at all. But not anybody else working for us, and not like vans coming there to deliver. It's just want myself or him. So if we had a restriction on uh, the use that restricted any local deliveries to just your personal vehicle, yes. that would match? Oh, that would be fine. Yeah. And I, I guess. Just more discussion. That's fine. Yes, sir. No, that, that's helpful. I think we just reopened the record just for comments from the. Yeah, comments yeah. Yeah. So. And just to follow up on that, so then my concern is just: <coughs> is this going to increase just the vehicular traffic from the applicant? I mean, if they have, you well, know, it's... ten deliveries in, is it just going to increase their driving to and from their house? 
You could do it all at once. That would be all the thing. <laughs> that would be the thing with your yeah. and because their number is up at 70 something technically. Well, and just to be clear, you know, section E specifically says what conditions we can <coughs> attach to an approval. And it says here are the conditions you can attach to approval of a conditional use. They can include, not limited to, off street, street improvements, access restrictions. So we certainly can put on those kind of restrictions on a conditional use approval in terms of the types of vehicle and the types of trips. Or, and the timing for deliveries. But let me. I, I'd note subsection F right after that, though, unfortunately. Oh, duration. Oh. <coughs> it doesn't look like that. At least that section doesn't permit us to limit or do a trial period. However, the not be included but not limited to an E, opens I would it say, up. Would say we opens do it. we like to. And technically, if we close the record? Yes. Again? Oh, right. I'm sorry. Is, is the record is closed. No, we're, no, we're not closing the record. We're nope. closing public comment. Uh, sorry, we've closed public comment. Okay. Thank you for my, my well, uh, word choice of words. Let me just sort of share a thought. Uh, these are good people. They're nice people. I think that the business is a clean business. I don't think it'll have a negative effect on the neighborhood. You know, high quality wine. But I don't really know. And I think changing zoning or changing use from residential to business is a very dangerous thing. It has to be done very, very carefully. And so what I would like would be in the event that we do go in favor, if the motion is made, that we put, it in, we put a clause in there that it only be for one year period, then I come back again. So we'll be able to see what it looks like in one year. I just make that recommendation. Because again, I think it's dangerous to allow uh, business encroachment in neighborhood zones. So I would simply, yes? uh, I am in agreement with you. And just uh, as a somewhat of an aside to uh, reaffirm what you're saying, the, the zoning, the business district in the top right corner of the map is right down the street from my house. A couple of years ago, there was a highly charged, contentious debate in town as to whether a property that abutted the business district would be allowed to open, a, be converted to business and allowed to open a small shop that was selling trinkets and kind of like a gift store. Highly, highly contentious issue. People were very, very opposed. It nevertheless went through uh, the process and, and was adopted. And that was a situation where there was debate as to whether to allow a business in next to the business district. Now we're talking about RC, which is the densest residential area in town, whether we're going to allow a business that's basically looking to be a wholesale liquor distributor into a residential neighborhood. I mean, the only reason that this even seems like it might even be feasible from my perspective is that it's on spur. If it was back in a neighborhood, but also in RC3, I would hope that we wouldn't even be entertaining the idea that of granting a conditional use permit. Well, we went through the criteria for a home business, which is permitted as a conditional use in the RC zone, which is where we're considering this application as being. And we determined that it met the definition of a home business that is allowed as a conditional use. So, so it's really not similar to the circumstance that you're talking about where that was not a permitted use in the zone. Here, that's not the case. It's a conditional use. It's a home business. We've already gone through that definition. And further, the ordinance specifies in section F under the conditional use regarding the duration of a conditional use approval. It specifically says that provided all the conditions and standards of approval are met, the conditional use shall be a continuing grant of permission for as long as the property is used for such purposes. So the way I read that is, though we have discretion to limit or condition many things, duration is not one of them. Well, let, let's, I think we're, we're kind of hung up on any conditions will be satisfied, but I think we're kind of now getting ahead to the, the real meat of the argument, which is D2 through 6. And I think we should probably have that discussion and then come back to conditions if the board is going to approve the conditional use. Because I think, obviously, if we're not going to approve the conditional use, then we don't 
That's a good point. We've just spent a half an hour, yeah. probably unnecessarily, but <coughs> why don't we go ahead to two through six and have that discussion? Any comments on criteria two through six? You know, I mean, I think the, the key ones here to me, I think, you know, creating hazardous traffic conditions, I, I, at least my view is I don't think it will. Um, creating unsanitary conditions, I, I think it's pretty clear that that's not going to happen. Um, four and five, mm -hmm. I think that's where, that, that, that's where we need to have some discussion. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and four, just for the record, is the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. And five, the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. Um, and if, if site plan and layout are simply the house itself, then maybe that's not an issue. Um, <coughs> value of, of adjacent properties. There's. You know, if, if, when I'm looking at, sec, at, at standards two through six, what we have to look at is whether there's evidence in the record right now that indicates that any of these are an issue. It's not our personal opinion. It's whether there's evidence in the record indicating that there's a concern on these items. Um, we have talked about traffic issues. Um, certainly neighbors have talked about that, and I think that is an area where we should probably be thinking about some conditions. Um, and with regard to unsanitary conditions, there's, I have not seen anything in the record, either in the application or from the abutters' comments that indicates that that is an issue. With regard to adverse effect to the value of adjacent properties, likewise, there is no indication in the record that this is going to impact the valuation of the adjacent properties. Certainly, it's not going to from a tax perspective. Um, Likewise, the proposed site plan and layout being compatible, I do look at that as kind of how. It's well, layout. although I, I think for that one, I mean, I think I, the, the, the layout, the site plan and layout, it, what they're talking about is storing a, what it could potentially be a substantial amount of beer and wine <coughs> in their house. And, and I think, is that, Compatible with is that similar? I mean, the words compatible is that compatible with adjacent property uses? And I'd also note you flip. It seems to me you flip the burden here. The burden is on the applicants to show all these criteria are met. So there might not be evidence in the record showing the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. But there's also no evidence in the record saying that that criteria is met. And they have the burden, not the the neighbors. They have the burden to establish that. All of the criteria are met, yes, but I'm certainly not aware of any conditional use applications where we've required people to go out and do assessments. I mean, what we look at is all of the criteria that they've said in their application, and um, we're not showing any alterations. Um, I don't see that as burden flipping. For me, it, it there has been no showing that it will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties, and I would assume that having a wholesale liquor distributor next door will, my, my operating presumption is that would affect neighborhood properties, especially since the concern was raised, if there's any evidence in the record, the concern was raised that it might lead to increase in crime because of the fact that there's a large amount of liquor that's sitting in the adjacent property. And that, if anything, would lower property value. So if anything, for me, the evidence indicates that criteria is not met. Also, we really don't have any enforcement. Um, you know, if someone has to, the applicant has to make sure these things are done, how do we even do anything beyond that? I mean, there's no one here that, well, do you do any enforcement? Do you go around and look at the list here? This is supposed to be this, this is supposed to be that? I don't think we've had many like this that we're proposing. But I don't, I don't think we have an enforcement arm it's, uh, that can do that. Uh, it, it's a question of as to whether the code enforcement officer is um, proactive or reactionary in the enforcement of the ordinances and any conditional use permits. And uh, the code enforcement officer is new, so. Um, no, but I'm being practical. Yeah. I, I understand. To, to answer the question honestly, with the typical workload of a code enforcement officer, we, we, we react to complaints and, uh, if, and 
you know, enforcement is generally complaint driven in the code enforcement world. Sure, yeah. Because that's what our time dictates. On page two of the application materials, all of the criteria um, for the standards of conditional use approval are listed, including this um, adverse affect to the value of adjacent properties. And the application does state that there will not be an adverse effect. We have a traffic study. That's a conclusion. As is the rest of the evidence. We As have. what? It's a, I was going to say it's a conclusory statement. Um, Do you have a copy of the traffic study that you make reference to? Uh, Someone's talking about traffic. Well, I mean, is the traffic study? They, they've cited to the traffic study, which shows. Is there a copy of it in here? I, I don't no, want to be an I attorney really here, but I mean. Dispute <laughs> it. Oh, what? Please, please, if you have any questions, comments. Well, I'm breaking them up and you make reference. That's why I'm saying a condition. Have it for one year. It's a trizy. I think Joanna's comment was that subsection F doesn't directly state, because other, subsection F says duration-wise, otherwise it's in perpetuity, the, the conditional grant, basically. They can run the business for 500 years. Once Didn't they have a comment to the contrary? Yeah, we, did, did someone else make a comment? I mean, what? Uh, so, Is Solomon here? <laughs> we have Solomon here? No. Joanna, you're not smiling. <laughs> I think the code enforcement officer raised the point that in the description under um, conditions of approval, there's some broad language that may include, but not limited to, such requirements as as follows. And that's, I think, the basis of that jurisdiction to have a, a condition, condition uh, use of. I, I guess my concern with that, and I mean, it, it, it holds some appeal that we would say you can do this for a year, but then what, what happens at that point procedurally? They have to come back, so basically, you know, this, this, this goes down for the March or April 2014 meeting in which they have to basically, it, this, it, I, I, it would seem like the only thing we could do would be to issue it for a year and then they would have to come back and reapply. I mean, we're not, I don't think we have Isn't power. that effectively an amendment to the ordinance? I mean, we're saying we're going to come up with this condition that's prohibited by the ordinance and put it on you, and you've got to operate your business under the assumption that you can do it for a year, but no more. It, well, the condition, the condition. we would be right. granting a conditional use for a year. And I think either Matt or, um, or Josh earlier noted that uh, rather than debating this for half an hour, we should determine whether the other criteria are met. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, go we're going we're back into the conditions. We're back into the conditions. We haven't even decided if we're going to even grant it. Right. So uh, we're getting the cart before the horse still. Right. Uh, I guess the point that we got stuck on was uh, paragraph, sorry, sub subsection D, standards for condition for use approval. And then <laughs> subparagraph 4, I talked about will not adversely affect the value of adjacent property. And the, so, uh, might I propose, um, so there's six criteria. It sounds like we're hung up on a couple of them. Are there any that we're not hung up on that we can just um, set aside and agree are met? I mean, one is obviously something else we'd have to deal with. I think we would all say that if we prescribe conditions that we would be convinced that they will be satisfied. I, think, I don't think we, there's any dispute on two or three. Or six. the real estate. So, do you want to make a motion? I'm. I'm <coughs> on two. I think that if I would want conditions on two. Sorry, the, the chair was saying which ones do we not have an issue with? So and the like, ones that we were just talking about, chair, can you just repeat the paragraph, please? So it sounds like conditions three and six. Um, it sounds like two there may be an issue with. Three and six might be ready for us to just vote that those criteria are met. Number three would be the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. And number six is the design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive design and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design appearance or architecture. Number four? Uh, Four, I think there's a dispute over. Yeah. So I, for, I would, for, I, I'll make a motion. Um, I move that we find that criteria three and six of the standards for conditional use approval are met. Second. Second. 
All in favor? Copy of what the design is going to be, or it's going to be the same as it is now? It's, no, there's no changes. no changes. So, all in favor? Two, three, uh, and unanimous. So, so, we've set aside three and six. In progress. <laughs> so, it sounds like, Joanna, you think two might need additional. Two is just an area where I would want, if we were to get to a place at the end of these discussions where we were doing a conditional use approval, I would want there to be restrictions on traffic. And, and, and I guess this and is. And I guess that would be an access restriction. Does it make sense now to, I mean, if, if three board members right now are going to vote this down, then we don't need to discuss this anymore. Right. Um, and but if, if, you know, three will vote in favor of this with certain conditions, I think we can probably start discussing those conditions. Um, I think we should probably get a sense of where we are right now um, because we could short circuit this if three people are going to vote this down and say for whatever reason they wouldn't grant a conditional permit, then we can move on. Be done. Be done. I think that's a good point. So I guess uh, my comment before, it sounds like you're ready to make a motion or do you want to continue the debate on each of the individual ones? My, my comment would be I, I would not um, vote in favor of a conditional use permit in, as a general matter for any type of wholesale liquor distribution business in an RC district. The only reason that this is even close to feasible is that it's on Spurwink. But I mean, Spurwink is, for all, uh, from my perspective, it's, it's one of the kind of secondary roads in town. But it, it, we could be talking about Sawyer, we could be talking about Shore, we could be talking about the old ocean, ocean house. It's, it, I, it, it's what not in an RA, it's not in an RB, it's not a budding a residential business, it's not a, a budding not, business district. That's not the standard we're applying. So, I mean, I, so what? So when I then turn to the, the standard as to which criteria are not met, four, proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. If I'm buying a residential property, I don't want one that has a basically a liquor, liquor distributor next door. Although you're, making, you're making assumptions that we, that would just be common knowledge. I mean, I'm one, I'm one buyer that's been removed from the market. So although it's a small fraction, it will impact the price. So unless someone here is... Well, unless someone here is willing to say that it would increase the value, the burden's on the applicant to show that it will not adversely affect. I don't think that's been met. Number, f um, uh, uh, for the record, it is wine and beer, not liquor, uh, to the extent I generalize and use the word liquor. I'm using it. Uh, <laughs> Number five, also, the proposed site uh, compatible with adjacent property uses and the comprehensive plan. It's not compatible with adjacent property uses. It's a residential business. It's not compatible with the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan contemplates that the business in town is going to be funneled into the residential, it's going to be funneled into the business district and the town center. Well, but that's just talking about site plan and layout. We're not talking about the use when we're talking about the comprehensive plan and the conformity thereof. I mean, this is a home business that is allowed as a conditional use. And if it were in the RP zone, R, or the RP2 zone, it would be permitted without a permit. Although we didn't fully parse out the, uh, I, I, I will, I, I will <laughs> so defer I to the text. So I think that when we're getting into talking about whether this is or isn't an allowed use, we need to remind ourselves that we went through the definition of home business and we concluded that this was within the definition of a home business, which is a use that is listed as permitted with a conditional use permit from us in the district. It is not a prohibited use, it's a conditional use. Do you think, we, we basically had comment brought in from uh, abutters who were concerned about potential crime from having a liquor, uh, not to use the word liquor, a wine and beer business, um, as opposed to storing, um, so something that wouldn't attract. I mean, I, mean I, I think there is, there, I think there is a difference between a home business selling, you know, lobster buckets. Yeah, or 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 you know, uh, birdhouses or or postcards or you know, artwork or or knitting sweaters. I think there is a difference between selling hand knit sweaters and 
selling beer and wine from your house. That, that's, it's different. But if they were selling high end uh, pizza, Technically, it, the I records. So, I, I mean, I, I, there's, there's a difference here. And I mean, I, I, I don't think we can ignore the fact that this is selling beer and wine, you know, alcoholic beverages from your house versus other things. Now, I mean, you know, if, if they were looking to sell cars, you know, if they were going to be purchasing, I mean, that, that would be something different also. Um, so I think that, that the particular goods that are for sale are relevant to the discussion. It's a, it is a little different than crafts. Chair May, uh, at a point, is the issue for discussion now that on the face of the application, and as we have assessed the home use of the use of the facility, the property as home business, is there a two, two, um, two assessments? One is when we start applying these factors one through six, is that based on the application? And if the answer is, if, if we get through one through six, then the answer is yes, but we're not really um, positive on the application, we can then assign conditions or tailor uh, the application or the conditional use. So if that's the case, I think we can have a vote as we currently see it, as, as the application is, as amended by the public record and testimony by the applicant this evening. So that's, if the answer is yes, we can grant a conditional use permit uh, for the, on that basis. Then we have to determine the conditions that go with that permit. That is where we would probably narrow, narrow the, uh, the use or the, the terms and the, the duration of the permit. How does that sound as a process? Well, I, yeah, it sounds like the, the threshold issue is whether there are three members of the board that think that the conditional use permit. So let's call it. Um, I move that we um, grant conditional use approval and move into discussion condi discussing conditions there too. Second. So repeat that. I move that we grant conditional use approval with conditions to be discussed after the vote on this motion. That's like a I've been using the word conditional, not in the way I was using it for one year. It was basically uh, with the condition. We'd talk about that after. Did, okay. did, and you seconded it? Is, no. No, you didn't? Okay, so is there a second? We're just talking about the, the principle. Yeah. I'll second it, <laughs> but I'd like to discuss this. So prior to the vote? Before, before the vote, I'd like to discuss. And, and it's just in terms of, it depends on the conditions. I mean, I, it obviously depends on the conditions. And I could change my mind if we can't come up with conditions that satisfy. You understand what I'm saying? So you're saying you might agree if the right conditions are attached. Right. And, and I'm, I feel the same way. I guess where I'm trying to get is, do we need to spend so, a couple more hours talking about this? Or what? are there? or if Do we not have three people anyway? If you withdraw your proposed motion, I'll come up with an alternative one that I think will get to that. Okay, I withdraw. All right, so, um, well, you need to withdraw too. Right. Your second. Did I second it? Yeah. You did, yes. All right, I withdraw my second. All right, so um, I would move that, we've, um, I move that we deny the conditional use application. Second. Okay, second. So, uh, a discussion, or can we vote and then this will get at what you wanted? Right. Vote. Okay. So, all in favor of denying the application? All opposed? So, three, three, two. So, with that. Move on to the findings of fact. So we have a list of proposed findings of fact, which I'll read the, the initial proposed ones. Uh, this is a request for a conditional use permit for a home business at 243 Spurwink Avenue, map U27, lot 19. 
Uh, number two, Jennifer and Kevin Flock are the owners of record for Map U27, Lot 19. Number three, the proposal is consistent with the definition of home business found in Section 1913 of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. And number four, the proposal does not satisfy the requirements of Section 1955 conditional use permits of the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Does anyone have any revisions? I would move that we uh, adopt the slate of findings effect as proposed. Any second? Oh, well, second it. Right, so all in favor of adopting the findings effect? I, I mean, I'll. Did it, or, or are we doing them all together? Yeah, yeah, that, that, I thought that's what we discussed. We were going to do them as slates where possible. Right? Okay. Wait, I'm confused. So, I, I, so the, the vote that's uh, the comment, uh, the discussion for this vote that's pending is we have four findings of fact that I just put forward. We're voting on them as a slate. What are the, you put forward the four that are on here? Well, the four that are on here with the, I have not. Four to okay. does not satisfy. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Yes. So, in, so all in favor of adopting the iterated findings effect with the modification with it's the mod it, I modified it as I read it from what's listed on the paper yes. to say the proposal does not satisfy the requirements rather than satisfies so with that all in favor of adopting the findings effect all opposed so three two With that, um, I regret to inform you the conditional use permit's been denied. Moving on to the next item of business, the chair would like to return to close us out. So um, next item on the agenda is any communications. Do we have any communications? No. And with that, uh, I'll adjourn us for the evening.